You are listening to Make Change Happen, the podcast from the International Institute for Environment and Development, IIED. In this episode, host Liz Carlisle talks with colleagues and international partners from the Transformative Urban Recovery Project, which has created a framework to provide a unifying urban vision to inform and resource an urban recovery process from COVID-19 and other potential future risks. Hello and welcome to the Make Change Happen podcast. This is Liz Carlisle, your host today, and with me are five experts on transformative urban recovery. I'll ask them to introduce themselves in just a moment, but I just wanted to say that this podcast is going to explore a little bit about what transformative urban recovery is and what are the important ways that we can achieve something that's much more reflective of a kind of social justice we would like to see. I think that we will hear a little bit about a framework, you know, why would we need such a framework, how it's been arrived at, and to make sure that we get the voices of what are usually excluded communities in the kind of urban recovery space. And those are the communities who are left out of decisions around basic service provision or housing or planning. So I hope this will be an interesting podcast. I'm sure it will give us lots to think about. And I'm looking forward to introducing our guests. Beth, can I start with you? Thank you, Liz. Uh, My name is Beth Tekwebiti. I'm the Acting Managing Director of the Slum Dwellers International Secretariat. I'm based in Cape Town. But uh, SDI works in uh, cities in the global south in 33 countries. Thank you. Great. Thank you. What about you, Joe? Thank you, Liz. My name is uh, Joe Maturi. I'm the coordinator of the Kenya Slum Dwellers Federation, which is an affiliate of Child Slum Dwellers International. I'm also the chair of Slum Dwellers International. I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. And Caroline? Hi, uh, my name is Caroline Skinner. I work for an NGO called Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing. One of our core constituencies are membership-based organizations of informal workers. Uh, So we work in many, many countries, largely in the global south, and have been monitoring the situation very closely. Great. Glad to have you with us today. And Sanandan. Thanks, Liz. I'm Sanandan Tiwari, Director of Global Implementation at the World Secretariat of ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability, that is based in Bonn, Germany. ICLE is a global network working with more than 2,500 local and regional governments that are committed to sustainable urban development. And welcome to you too. And last, but by no means least, Anna. Hi, I'm Anna Woolnicki, and I'm a researcher in uh, the Urban Research Group at IID. Most of my work focuses on urban poverty and informality, working in particular with grassroots organisations and federations of the urban poor in cities across the global south. And great to have you all with us. So I I guess my first question, how is COVID-19 affecting the communities and the groups or the organisations you're working with right now? Sunandan, can we start with you? As ICLE, we uh, work directly with local and regional governments, so that is our entry point. And these are also frontline agencies that are having to deal with the pandemic situation. So this crisis has actually put the spotlight and amplified what I would just like to call three existing challenges that local governments actually face. One is the finance gap, which is an impact that we see across all the regions that we work with. This we see across in terms of city budgets that are shrinking due to the significant economic slump because of the crisis. And secondly, cities are actually having to now repurpose existing budgets and human resources to prioritize actions to contain the spread of the virus. So this has widened the existing financial gap that we have always had at the local level. Secondly, you have the governance gap, that is in terms of the structures of collaboration across different levels of government and the devolution of power. 
to the local level and local governments actually being the bodies that interact with communities most closely do not always have this power to may affect the change that this current crisis is actually demanding and finally there is the capacity gap which is you know actually empowering these local governments with training and human and financial resources to address these challenges so these are areas actually that we as a cre we work through and the pandemic has only further exacerbated these challenges but i would also say that it has provided a window of opportunity to ex- accelerate change right so although really tough challenges perhaps th- this can be a moment that that's kind of good to hear caroline what about you So it's interesting we looking at it from the perspective of informal workers almost in contrast and really the impact has been devastating early on in the crisis the international labor organization estimated that 1.6 billion of the informally employed bearing in mind that there's about 2 billion people across the world who are informally employed that's around about 60% of of all workers would be particularly negatively impacted amongst the worst in their words they estimated in the developing world 82% of earnings from the informal economy would be lost and this was proven to be correct so in the hard lockdown period it has been devastating we've seen particularly high reports of food and security among workers themselves and their children and if you think about it in lived reality terms informal workers tend to be hand to mouth in terms of their livelihoods and don't have savings to fall back on so really they've been particularly hard hit and also women have been disproportionately hard hit so much so that many of the analysts are calling this rather than a re- recession a, a c session so there really has it spotlighted women's role in the economy and also disproportionate role in in caring responsibilities on the upside this has spotlighted the important essential services that informal workers provide um so think in the transport space getting goods and services around cities the important role that informal food vendors and other informal players in the food system are playing so there has been a greater profile for for the important role that the informal economy plays So uh, Joe I mean listening to what Sanandan and Caroline are saying does some of this resonate for you for your communities and organizations is this the same or are there differences uh, I think they are the same just picking up from what Caroline was saying if you look at most of the people who live in informal settlements most of them uh, work as casual laborers in factories uh, they are engaged in one form of informal business or the other basically it's a hand to mouth daily survival so with impact with the coming of covid i think they are the ones who suffered most one of the things that i think contributed to the situation that we are currently in in terms of the economic impact of slum dwellers the government response was more of security was more of policing was more of a clamp down making sure everybody is indoors at curfew hours trying to en- enforce the social distancing which is practically impossible in an informal settlement given the population density so we had seen a lot of uh, businesses shutting down both the formal and the informal there was a lot of organization coming up providing washing station providing masks now that is not happening anymore uh, we see a lot of people happening now the city of nairobi and the adjacent counties have been shut down there was a demonstration which was clamped by the police people who are in the informal sector had organized a demonstration that pushed for the government to open up the country so what we're seeing is a very steep learning curve for everybody really and I, i suppose the challenge is how are we going to get out of this and what will come next beth how is this playing out from your perspective for slum dwellers international work in slum communities and informal settlements the pandemic is occurring in the context of multiple deprivation so a majority of communities live without secure tenure so they are prone to evictions they live without access to water and sanitation but at the same time the dominant uh, messaging uh, at the beginning of the pandemic was that you need to socially distance you need to wash your hands in the context where communities do not actually have these services the un is actually estimated that in the population of people living in slums has grown from 2018 by 
4%. So you can actually see just how big this problem is for cities in the global south. But perhaps also what we saw at the beginning of the crisis was an acknowledgement by communities that we are actually on our own. And uh, if we have to find ways to manage this crisis, we have to innovate and uh, use our collective capabilities and capacities to support each other across the network. That's what we found. This obviously is not measured to the extent of the pandemic and what is required, but definitely has uh, demonstrated just the power that is there in local organizing and finding solutions that come at the local level. And that's really good to hear, Beth, because I think it's a good reminder to us, isn't it, that the pandemic has been one of the latest challenges, but it's by no means the only challenge for these kinds of communities. They have to respond every day to some very considerable things that they personally and through their own groups need to deal with. And presumably they're innovating, they're finding solutions. So how, how do we support that? How do we support that in a way that gets the kind of recovery that we're looking for? Um, the first thing is to understand what people are already doing. Our experience in SDI has been that in a lot of cases when government comes with programs, they often do not acknowledge what is already happening on the ground. The same can be said for emergency aid. There often is an elitism around external solutions are the best. But I, for me, I think the first point of call would be to actually say what is happening already, what are communities doing on their own, and how can external support scale up those initiatives. That would be the first point from my perspective. If you look at what uh, the the Kenyan affiliate that Joe is part of have done around finding solutions to economic disjuncture with economic activity because people were in lockdown, they have used the data they have collected over the years in informal settlements as a basis to negotiate with government and other agencies for cash transfer. So they already had a repository of information that could be used to prioritize who in those communities needed support immediately. In South Africa, the SDI affiliates collaborated with other stakeholders and civil society organizations to do rapid assessment of the availability of water and sanitation in informal settlements and use that information to then uh, lobby or present that information to government as a resource for them to actually provide these services. That sounds really interesting. Joe, can you give us an example of sort of how these cash transfers work that Beth's talking about? A lot of organizations uh, were looking for how do we support informal uh, people living in informal settlements. So one of the things is that the government came to us. Uh, we worked with three organizations, the bank, uh, the government, and a bank, and uh, an organization in the UK called Give Direct. So they didn't want people to go collecting data. So they wanted people who already had the information. They had contacts. We are talking names, identification numbers, and mobile, because these were going to be cash transfers. So we worked with Give Direct which was giving 3000 per month for four months. Uh, the government was giving um, 2000 per month for three months, and KCB Bank was giving 1000 shillings uh, every week for three months. So that kind of helped. And we had a number of also local organizations, foundations, churches that also uh, used our information to provide uh, foodstuffs and other support. Uh, we also are part of the County of Nairobi COVID Committee. And one of the things that also got into that, we were more or less forward thinking in terms of identifying because most of the quarantine centers were hospitals, schools. We also started also looking at and mapping out, just in case it comes to us in informal settlements, we started mapping out which are the possible quarantine centers for people living in informal settlements within their neighborhood. Thank you. Anna, do you want to um, add anything here from your experience or projects that you've worked with? Any reflections? I guess what we're hearing from Joe is is something that we at IID have been trying to give a platform to throughout the context of the pandemic. When the crisis first hit, there was so much so much discussion about the impact that COVID was having in cities and countries in the global north, but less so about what was actually happening in cities and also even less about the sort of innovation that was happening. 
And Caroline, I think, I mean, if you work in the informal economy, you certainly have to be innovating all of the time. Um, so I imagine some of the things, particularly the points that Beth was making around innovation, really echo for you. Uh, is there any kind of example that would help our listeners kind of get a feel for this? So, yes. I mean, I think there was, uh, under hard lockdown, let's be honest, most people were unable to work. But there were amazing innovations around um, information dissemination, around support. So where the state failed, which it did in many, many cases, informal workers demonstrated a huge solidarity among themselves. It would be interesting to hear whether this echoed similarly with slum dwellers, but really striking lobbying with local churches and, and local authorities, and when that failed, uh, supporting each other. Post, you know, we're seeing this kind of very gradual recovery in inverted commas, where people are slowly going back to work. Um, in some contexts, obviously going into hard lockdown in others. So India is a real concern uh, for all of us at the moment. But there have been innovations where people have started going back to work um, to really minimize health risks. If you think of the street vendor space, people have redesigned areas. They've come up with their own lovely designs for wash stations, you know, social distancing, messaging. So there's some really interesting innovations around taking seriously the threat to health. I mean, I think what's really important here is also not to let the state off the hook. So I think that the cash we have seen some some innovations uh, at national level around cash transfers. Sometimes informal workers many times have fallen through the gaps. But I think we've got to keep the pressure on the state to get the giant wheels of the economy going again through the cash transfers, through getting monies back into the economy. The informal workers, small business support is very important. Um, and to acknowledge that these folk are small businesses in the global north, there's been a lot of focus on, on what a devastating impact lockdown measures have had on small businesses. It's similarly the case in, in the global south. And, and yet we're seeing that informal workers are falling through the gaps. Uh, they're not big enough to access the grants that have been available. Um, so we've got to keep our careful eye on the state and make sure that those who most need it get the support that they need to rebuild. For informal workers, they've used their last resources. They've sold many assets. So, you know, we've done research in 12 cities and it's it's remarkable the extent to which people have had to dig into their very last resources just to see themselves through lockdown and now really need injections to restart again. So I think that, you know, it's getting the balance between celebrating the innovation that's happening on the ground, but, but also seeing that there's a need for systemic change and that we need to keep the pressure up on the state to deliver and build back better. So I, th I think that's good to hear, Caroline. You know, we must let the state off the hook. So I think that leads us perhaps back to you, Sunandan, to say, you know, what about local government? How are they reacting? What support can they perhaps lend or what support do they need in order to be able to, to play their role? Uh, you talked earlier about challenges of finance and governance and their capacity, but do, do you have perhaps any examples where you've seen different efforts or things that people might be able to replicate? It's actually very interesting listening to my fellow panelists that no matter from which perspective you look at the current crisis, what we see is that it is significantly amplifying existing challenges and problems that we have. For me, it really underlines the fact that you, know, you need this fundamental and, as we're saying here, transformative changes that really need to be done. And this is a huge symptom of the larger problems that we have to deal with. We find something very similar that the local governments also challenge with. Uh, Joe was talking about maps and information. That was the same problem with local governments, is that they did not really have necessary information very often in terms of how to then deal with the situation. And they needed guidance on that. And very often we, our offices were approached in terms of providing resources. Another way of actually going about it was what are other cities doing? And therefore, we organized a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning and exchange where cities could really share with each other 
what it is that they were doing, how were they dealing with this critical situation. Joe also mentioned maps, and Beth had mentioned innovation. We've seen also local governments using some of the work that they have done earlier to deal with the current situation. So, for example, in terms of maps, where specifically around looking at climate impacts, where vulnerability maps have been developed for the cities. Typically, the most vulnerable to climate impacts are also the ones in informal formal sectors, living on the fringes or in slums. And these maps were then further upgraded to help the cities to identify which would be the most vulnerable zones and also to support some form of contact tracing and to predict, you know, the potential impact. Our South Asia office, for example, then worked with 17 cities to really look at that. So cities really were interested in seeing where the impacts are, what is it that they can do. Also, I think Caroline had mentioned about the, the transport space. In the transport space, we are seeing cities now working more closely with different actors to provide better service. For example, in Pasig City, in, which is part of Metro Manila, the city actually tied up with the private sector to provide free uh, public transportation services to government and medical workers so that they could really travel. We also found the non-motorized transport, for example, bicycle lanes that were really being pushing for in a number of cities got quite a push as part of the COVID situation. Another interesting example was in promoting electric vehicles and some of the cities then decided to use these electric vehicles to deliver groceries and other subsistence needs to their citizens. These may not have been going to the most marginalized, but just to say that the cities were also thinking about what do they have at hand and how can they then use it to deal with the current situation. Definitely cities are very stretched, but I would say that they are standing up to the challenge. And I think that's really interesting, isn't it? We've seen that all over and all of the things that you've been talking about are when people are faced with a crisis, they innovate. And the trick here is to get those innovations working together and get those communities and different voices working together. And I know all of you have been thinking about what is a strategic vision for the future. And although it might seem like talk of, you know, the COVID-19 recovery feeling a bit preemptive, you know, we're kind of not there yet. But there are conversations that are going on internationally that we know are kind of potential decision points. So things like the Commonwealth Local Government Forum, the Climate Change Conference of the Parties later in the year, and of course, the World Urban Forum next year. So what have we got in that vision that we can sort of help share with others? Perhaps I can just ask all of you to sort of give some pointers about what we can do to achieve a fair and green recovery for those people living in in our urban spaces. Anna, would you like to start? That would be great to hear from you. We at IID have been stuck in London for the last uh, 12 or 14 months, given the pandemic, and in an attempt to try and reflect on some of the innovation that's been happening, some of the responses that are underway in cities all over the world, we've been convening workshops and discussions with grassroots organisations, federations of the urban poor, other researchers and international agencies in an attempt to try and develop something of a vision or a, or a framework that speaks to a transformative urban recovery. And I guess, you know, we're not only facing the, the crisis that is COVID-19, we have the existing issues of poverty and inequality, which all of our guests today have gone into in, in quite some depth. But on top of that, I guess there's a there's a funding crisis that's been exacerbated in the UK by cuts to overseas development assistance. Municipal authorities are facing have curtailed budgets. So I guess what we've been trying to get at is a, a common shared vision based on collaboration across scales and across diverse actors has more scope to achieve success in the current context. Um, Beth, can I ask you, uh, you know, in response to what Anna says, d does this work for you, this shared vision? Is this something that you guys want to get behind as well? Yes, definitely. So SDI has been participating and contributing to this conversation uh, that IIED has been championing. And mainly from, I suppose, two perspectives. At the local level, the COVID pandemic, what it has essentially shown is that the city is a system and that what deprivations in uh, slum communities can and will impact life in the higher income areas. And, and of course, this has been replicated uh, globally because 
if you look at just how the pandemic sort of like transformed, there is a, a very clear indication of our connectivity. So in that respect, a shared vision around what it is that is required to transform. But for me, I think transformation is not just about getting out of the crisis, but actually to ensure that there are step changes in how people experience their lives in informal settlements or informal way and ensuring that we are prioritizing whatever little resources local authorities have to what is absolutely a priority. We often see in, in the cities where we work in, in SDI that there might be a prioritization for a large project that is really just about and I think there's a particular word which which, which escapes me, but more sure than is actually required by community. So you will have a city put up a statue, I think it's called vanity projects, while communities do not have uh, water or sanitation. So I think revisiting the prioritization of what is required in our cities. The cities can claim they don't have resources, but as SDI always find that they no resources for water or sanitation, but they have resources for for these vanity projects. So I think a shared vision and some agreements of what are priorities is absolutely critical. Then, of course, at the global level, it's really also around the the prioritization of where international aid is going. And here, I, I think as slum dwellers, we share a lot of sympathy with local authorities because they are often excluded out of these conversations with national governments taking the center stage, but implementation as well as uh, the expression of the challenges is always at the local level. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Good to hear your thoughts. Caroline, do you want to add at this point what, what you see the opportunity of a shared vision might be? So I think all of us have been in real crisis management mode, really responding to the needs of our particular constituencies. Um, and I think what IIED has done is, is provide us a lovely platform to um, move beyond our silos and look up a little bit. And really, this is a, a moment to kind of get together, as we did interestingly around the pressure to introduce a dedicated urban SDG. So there's kind of these key moments in the urban space where all of of us who are working in our silos, but all kind of concerned with a just city, should be coming together. And it's a lovely way of saying, let's work on, on a kind of shared framework of building back better. So so not to be too glib about it, but there is a kind of sense of like, don't waste a good crisis. This has generated a real shakeup across the economic space. You know, there's new social protection innovations, people who you would never believe would have supported things like cash grants are behind it. There's a real shakeup in the planning space. So we've got to really use this space to put on the table some concrete alternatives, particularly around building back in a, in a greener, more people-centered way. So I think that IIED has really filled an important gap and kind of just opening up the conversations about what innovations are happening um, and how we can scale them up is really important. And I think what you've identified, Liz, of like there's a few key moments that are critical to insert the shared vision that are coming ahead of us. I think it's a great initiative. And I really like what you say, Caroline, about using a crisis. <laughs> I think um, we've seen in so many areas of our life recently that we can use this crisis as an opportunity. So at the end of the podcast, uh, this podcast is all about make change happen. So I, I like to ask our guests, what is a change they would like to see? Joe, what is a big change that you think this crisis can give us? What could be a big change that we make right now or, or a message of change that we can send? I think the crisis has shown us that most the attitude at the moment, if you look at the challenges of people living in former settlements of slums across the global south, people usually say those are their problems. The lack of access to sanitation, clean water, finance. People should usually say those are their problems, but this crisis has shown us that it's our problem. It's the government's problems, it's the city's problem, it's the residents' problem, it's the corporate world 
problem. Uh, and I think this should kind of uh, change the attitude uh, on how people look at uh, some of these challenges and what Godfrey was saying, how all of us are connected. And for us, the message has been very clear. It's how in the future and the opportunity now, how do we include the marginalized in the designing of a project, in the implementation, right to implementation. So those are the things that I think probably at the moment uh, we need to focus on. Thank you. I really think I can really hear from all of you the importance of this shared vision. This needs to be shared. It needs to be shared widely, both at local level, community level and at international level. Sinandan, perhaps you can have the last word on what positive change we should be looking for. I think what we really need is a change in mindsets across all sectors and scales and how we perceive growth and prosperity and actually then work more collaboratively towards you know, making this change happen. This sounds very broad and airy, but for me, it always comes down to that. It's just in the way we think, the way we plan, the way we design. That is a very fundamental change that is really required in all these aspects. And we really need to then, you know, really build that critical mass of like-minded organizations to effectuate that change. That's great. Thank you very much. So, just finally, down to me to thank you all very much indeed for really interesting discussion today. And I guess also for us all to keep our fingers crossed to join in with this discussion, join in with making sure that we can achieve a transformative urban recovery and move on to a more socially just future. Thank you very much. You can find out more about this podcast, our guests and their work at iied.org slash podcast, where you can also listen to more episodes. You can leave us feedback or follow the series at soundcloud.com slash the IIED. That's soundcloud.com slash T-H-E-I-I-E-D. is produced by our in-house communications team. For more information about IIED's work, please visit us online at www.iied.org. <laughs>